thank you everyone so much for coming. Uh, this is Highly Reinforced, a fireside chat on reinforcement learning for newcomers to machine learning. At ACE, we currently have about 30 different content streams focused on various machine learning topics. And this one is um, the newcomers to AI content stream, where we've been meeting for about once a month uh, to go over kind of high level introductory conversations about various topics in machine learning, including reinforcement learning, which is the reason that we're here today. And we have uh, three excellent speakers who are uh, joining us and sharing their wisdom. I have uh, bios for each of them. So I will introduce you guys and then we can just start in with some questions and conversation. So Susan, Susan Xu Cheng is a data scientist who builds machine learning models and infrastructure at scale. She's currently a principal data scientist in FinTech in a previous role, she created a custom open AI gym environment for a reinforcement learning project in production. Susan is the reinforcement learning lead at Aggregate Intellect in our steering committee. She's also an indie game developer and a widely sought after public speaker. So welcome, Susan. Thank you, glad to be here. Great. Florian, Florian Goebbels has more than 10 years experience in data science and a PhD from the University of Munich he currently works as a VP at BMO's Capital Markets. Welcome, Florian. Justin. Justin Gerard is the Chief Technology Officer at Pax Financial, a platform that allows people to create artificially intelligent trading agents. Before Pax Financial, Justin was a co-founder of Fleet Ops and a lecturer at the University of Toronto. Justin received his master's in space mechatronics from the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies and has published theoretical work in the area of multi-agent reinforcement learning. Learning, Welcome, uh, welcome Justin, glad to have you here. All right, let's, uh, let's dive into the topic. And I thought a good place to start would be kind of uh, definitionally, uh, start at the beginning, what is machine learning? So I just wanna ask each of you, maybe starting with Florian, if you could describe machine uh, reinforcement learning from your perspective and, Let's make it a two-part question. What excites you about reinforcement learning? So reinforcement learning is, the goal is to train a model that can kind of solve or deal with an environment. And the way it works is that it tries to optimize a certain, like a certain value function. And the big difference, say, you would say from, um, say, regular machine learning methods such as a regression or clustering or classification, that these have some kind of very distinct objective function. Say, say both classification and um, regression are more or less the same problem. That they have some kind of error function they try to minimize. And you kind of do the same in, in, in reinforcement learning. But the thing is, at the same time, what you're minimizing or what you're dealing with is kind of maximizing, maximizing kind of a value function. So you kind of try to maximize the expected future reward of a certain state given a certain action. And there are several neat tricks and ideas they, they done to do this. So long before the deep reinforcement learning, normal reinforcement learning dealt a lot of uh, how can I deal, how can I estimate and optimize these kind of, these kind of value estimate, estimators? And similar, say, to regression models or classification models, they have their own set of way of iteratively improve with each learning rate, with each learning iteration. And what makes me excited about reinforcement learning is that because you, you kind of... You, learn through experience, right? Unlike say regression, we have a fixed error function, then you kind of go down a gradient. What it does is you kind of run the game. You kind of have an estimate how good your game, how good you should perform in a game. And then you play, keep playing game, create new data. And then you use kind of the new data you generate to kind of improve, systematically improve your estimate in a kind of empirical way. If it's, which allows you that you can improve kind of any kind of value function. So this allows you the option to have this kind of general machine machine learning, machine learner, 
So it can be used to solve any kind of problem, whereas for like technically, and that uh, makes it very flexible and very versatile. You see, like reinforcement learning algorithm using for all kinds of problems, say eh? self driving cars or playing games or chatbots or for finance. So that's that would be my answer. Okay, that's great. Um, Susan, let's hear uh, your perspective on uh, reinforcement learning and its excitement. Sure, yeah, I guess my answer is going to be slightly more more simple just for because it's the first question. I'm going to just like go into more depth later on. But I guess for me, um, reinforcement learning is kind of like learning through trial and error. And there is a little bit of uh, kind of a mindset shift when dealing with reinforcement learning problems compared to, let's say, uh, other types of supervised learning or unsupervised learning problems. And Florian touched upon that a little bit um, in terms of, you know, how the problem is structured and how we're getting these iterations and improvements. Um, I think what fascinates me about this in general is that there is a question of how to represent um, like a kind of environment that the reinforcement learning agent is learning in and kind of how we define what's good and what's bad, right? So, I mean, in a very common example of self-driving car, like how do you define what's a good action, what's a bad action? And that's something that um, I guess data scientists or uh, whatever role you want to call it that's working on these kind of have to um, spend some time thinking about. And I think that's um, challenging and industry it interesting in that regard and the other part that i really enjoy is kind of learning through the deployment in a real environment and kind of like graduating from um closed environments uh, i guess for example chess right like i i guess reinforcement learning grew a lot um since uh, kind of its applications in super closed environments such as i guess chess only etc and then kind of moved more and more to more ambiguous environments such as I guess StarCraft 2 and then to real world. So I think that part really fascinates fascinates me because that's like the really difficult part of reinforcement learning. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Justin. Yeah, so um I think I can be potentially very reductive. I I usually define reinforcement learning as dealing with um or separating concepts of state, action, reward, and transition functions in a in a in a potential environment. So not all, uh, not all. So I, I concern myself a lot with uh, markup decision processes, and so I'm heavily. I don't, I don't know offhand if I'm correct in saying that all reinforcement learning deals with MDPs or or partially observable MDPs, but I think that's commonly the case. And uh, my personal interest is in representation of transition functions and model-based reinforcement learning. I think that um, I'm very excited about the idea of knowledge representation. So uh, the idea that you can learn different transition or reward kernel functions, um, because there you can get a lot of state space savings and you can um, characterize your agents. Uh, I think um, I, I, I think a lot about this mental experiment where if you're riding a bike down the street and someone says, try to ride your bike, you're learning to ride a bike, it can be very challenging. But if someone says to you, hey, you know, you can concentrate on pedaling and it's a separate problem than steering. And to me, this idea that you can break problems up into um, different sorts of models is uh, sort of a, what, what makes the future of reinforcement learning exciting. I think people are starting to think this way um, about hierarchical models. And I think that's very exciting. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, Susan, maybe I could get you to, like some of this has come up already in the conversation, but maybe I could get you to just walk us through some of the best known uh, examples of reinforcement learning, just, just to kind of set the groundwork. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess I'll bring up some common examples, like whether I've personally worked on them or not. So I guess, yeah. um, let's say chess, or I guess the, the game Go, which is a focus of um, Google DeepMind, and they have published a lot of papers, and that's kind of how I got interested in reinforcement learning um, at the beginning. So um, games such as that, I guess more recently, uh, games like StarCraft II or uh, just like more uh, open-ended environments. And then I guess self-driving cars is another um, very well-known example. And I think for industry in particular, for those working in industry and 
a kind of like my experience has been like actually anything that can you can kind of learn through trial and error through a sustained period of time. Um, like you, you have set aside X amount of months to be gathering data and allowing the agent to update. As long as your problem can be framed like that and you have the infrastructure to deal with that. I mean, if you really wanted to use reinforcement learning and feel that it makes sense to solve it um, like that, then those can also be use cases. Okay, yeah. great, great, thanks. Um, now, I know that not all of you can talk about the work that you do in the day-to-day, -day, um, but Justin, you and I chatted a little bit about your organization and what it does uh, as, as a kind of implementation of reinforcement learning. Maybe you could uh, tell the audience a bit about that. Yeah, so um, I, I'm so deep into the project that uh, I, I'm going to try to walk myself back right away. Um, Essentially, uh, what, what we have become initially concerned with is uh, a lot of reinforcement learning can be challenging because you need to have agents that can play. They need to have a simulation or a, a, a somewhat realistic environment to play in. You have to be able to run scripts where they can execute actions over various states and regress to some sort of behavior policy. And so uh, a lot of uh, my practical attention um, revolves around creating a realistic um, agent scenario uh, that, that tracks market dynamics. So, you know, if an agent acted this way in the stock market, uh, you know, last week, what would they expect to have? What would be expected to happen? Um, we do, you know, and so that's a lot of what Pax Financial does is, is the curating and the, uh, the optimization of uh, this, this sort of multi-agent framework such that people can, you know, create an agent and see what kind of policies it would learn. And they can expect that, generally speaking, how it will behave in the future is going to be somewhat similar. Um, so that's that's already a very hard problem. Um, and then, um, practically speaking, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the reason, you know, deep, deep learning exists in, in reinforcement learning, the reason people are using neural networks to characterize certain functions is because the state spaces are so huge. So that's that's a persistent problem as well, but that's a, that's, yeah. So that's kind of what we do. We create this like simulation environment and um, eat a lot of the under the surface sort of uh, tracking problems. Like why, it, you know, simulated car driving has the same problem. We have to simulate how many hours of driving. We can't just drive a car into a wall 1000 times. So this is one of the core challenges. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, curious to get your opinion. Um, with products like what you're working on, how safe is that for the end user? Like, should I entrust my financial decisions to artificial intelligence? Like, it's it's like the car, right? You don't you don't want to get uh, driven into a wall. Um, are we at this point where um, it's this can be used in production by people safely? Um, I can't speak for everyone working in fintech, and I, I can't speak for the kind of behavior policies that they discovered or that they optimized. But I know, in personal experience, I, uh, I, I'm not I'm not a native in finance. I'm a native in robotics, and I, I, I naively thought, oh, finance is going to be so so cool and so easy. There's so much clean data, so none of the data is clean. Um, but what I actually found to be the the most difficult aspect of uh, of, of the solution was actually. Um, um, the management of it's more infrastructure problems. So you, you train this really great policy and you can actually, I don't know, we're having the experience that with a better than better, far better than chance, we can kind of forecast where the market will move um, in a different, in a, in a given time scale. So we could say with say 75 or 80% accuracy in the next week, the security is going to change in this way. But um, the security may fluctuate by, you know, 40 by 10 percent during that week. So then you have another problem, which is, OK, well, on the time scale of an hour or on the time scale of a month. And uh, I think juggling different time scales uh, adds another level of complexity. And so I think um, I guess what I can say is that when you train models, you are always bogged down with practical considerations that a human being will detect instinctively that a robot, even though it's correct it's missing a bunch of nuance in the situation. And I think that most, even self-driving cars, you know, uh, you have situations where you, the sensor doesn't pick up something because it's dark at night. And I think 
you know, these are these are sort of open challenges in artificial intelligence, the, sen the, the sensors that we have and the, the state space we craft as a human being may not fully characterize the problem we're trying to learn. Right. OK. And so and so that for that reason, I think unsupervised or I don't want to say unsupervised, but um, automatic uh, uh, models or automatic systems are probably still a ways out. I think that every every even every robo sort of AI advisor will probably need to be closely supervised by a team for the foreseeable for for some time. Yeah. Right. I've, but not because of the AI, because of our ability to sense and characterize the state space, I think. Right, right. Okay, Florian, I wanted to ask your opinion on the same topic. So let me a little bit elaborate what I do at BMO Capital Markets. So at BMO Capital Markets, I'm part of the BMO data cognition team. And the way a capital market is organized that each desk is kind of its individual unit within BMO Capital Markets. And each desk has its own risk limits and its own way of doing its trade and it's doing business, eternal business. And there are certain problems or we identify problems which we think that are can be solved or improved with machine learning. With and we, of course, we try to select those issues or those projects we believe to have a good chance to be successful or be more successful, and also generate a lot of value for for BMO capital markets. And this is where the fit we come in. So we go to a desk or a desk reach out to us and say, okay, we have this this business and we have this problem and we think AI can help with it. And then we're going to evaluate and say, okay, is it possible? And if it is possible, what, how good can we do it? And what would the possible value generated through it? The way I see it is if you want to do trading in general, it's, it's, it's a rather difficult problem, right? There's a reason that, there are so few. Let, let, let me say this. You, you don't see that many hedge, hedge funds founded by former Google AI employees. You don't see those hedge funds, right? And there's a reason for that. And there is a lot of complications with finance. And that's beyond, beyond the pure data managing and pure prediction, right? There are regulations. There are kind of prices to entry, right? So you want to do execution and then what kind of trading you want to do, right? And these are all things you have to think of and to figure out if you want to do something, right? And there are financial problems that are well understood. And there are also known like machine learning solutions, not machine learning, machine learning solutions, yes, but not deep learning or something really outrageous. And they tend to work. And then there's a question like, how new or how novel is your idea? And how crowded is the space, right? So if you think in terms of market or finance, one big term, people call it better, right? And better is just how the whole market moves, right? So if you say last year, right, the whole market, beginning of last year market went down, right? But then you look at any tech company on average, all of the tech companies went up 300 or 400 like percent, right? They all went up three, four times. So this was basically, people would say it was a big better movement because it wouldn't really matter which, which company you pick, right? So all the smaller tech companies all move up a lot. And the, another term is called like, probably term people use, like to use called alpha. And the alpha term is, where you say you perform better than the market, say when everyone is taking 200 or 300%, say you take 600% or even more. Okay, last year's uh, these uh, numbers are very, very exaggerated. These are not normal market conditions. And normally people say, oh, once you, you, you find the offer, you, you try not to tell other people about this, right? Because when you have the new, the novel offer, you don't want the space to be crowded, right? Say if you make, a good trading strategy, right? And then there's also a reason why a lot of these kind of hedge funds and these capital kind of management, they have kind of limited allocation. So they have a trading strategy and say, okay, this trading strategy can be allocated this amount of money and we can make this amount of revenue. So you cannot even allocate more money then the trading strategy won't work anymore. And then say, say um, to Sigma, they kind of closed their, their investment fund. Like you cannot invest with them anymore. So they said, okay, for all the trading strategies we have, we have the maximum allocation. And then they just 
keep trading on what they have and then they manage have this kind of asset under management and like justin says it really boils down what is your your, your time span right if you go say to to a pension right to a pension industry pension plan like cpp they they live in a time space from 15 to 20 years right and then you go to high frequency traders they live in a time space of 100 milliseconds 10 to 100 milliseconds right so and both of them have have their own technique and model and ideas and solutions and this is just the first layer of complexity to all this finance want to do work in finance right then you go to all the assets right you go to options you go to futures you go to equities you go to uh, fixed income you go to um how are these traded over the counter uh, corporate bonds yada 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 and everything has its own unique laws and rules and regulations and yada, all that jazz and these are all things you need to take into consideration so one thing the whole crypto or space gave or created was something a little bit more lever uh, like even even fielded for everyone because the entry is very easy the transaction costs are very low and the transaction speeds are more or less that you cannot buy to have faster transaction costs so if who, who knows like who i think everyone heard of new york stock exchange right and who thinks New York Stock Exchange is located on Wall Street? New York Stock Exchange is no longer located at Wall Street. This is just like a show building. So the New York Stock Exchange has been moved somewhere north in a secret location in some salt mines. I didn't know this. And they have like racks and racks and racks of computer. And buying some computer space to the New York, Stacks, New York uh, Stock Exchange is very expensive. So one of the first digital exchanges right it was called island and they weren't doing really well because this was in the 70s 80s i think or maybe 90s where where um they just rented an office next to the new york stock exchange so they have like faster speed to the new york stock exchange new york stock exchange moved just to have more space because they make money selling those air racks those area to have your pc and that's the first level right so then a very, the other major exchange is in Chicago, right? There's a Chicago exchange where people trade a lot of, um, I think, fixed income and the commodities. And there is a latency between um, Chicago and New York, right? And people were struggling with this a lot. So one person had a brilliant idea. You know what? Uh, I'm going to build a cable, like a straight cable through the lake, through the mountain, just straight line between chicago and uh, new york's new york stock exchange and the second he went fundraising he raised like more than two or 200 or 300 percent of what he needed to rent and people were bidding each other higher and higher to get space on that on that cable right so they say oh i want to do high frequency trading right oh you you won't be able to afford this this connection on those cables right so this field is not very uh, level if you want to do traditional uh, uh, instruments, but if say I want to do crypto, I feel like it's a bit more more even playing field. I just want to add something about crypto because most of our initial traction and our pilots uh, have been in crypto, and our experience with the APIs from Binance and from other exchanges and even decentralized exchanges is that because they're new technology. Um, and by new, I mean, you know, developer centric, uh, you know, a lot of sort of Linux coders, AP, uh, API developers have made these things. Um, they work really well and they're really easy to integrate with. And I think that's why part of the reason that uh, it's easier, uh, part of the reason they're becoming popular as financial instruments is because people who want to treat this as a profession, who aren't well funded, who don't have a lot of money for infrastructure, uh, you know, like PAX when we started. Um, can jump into crypto and it's a lot easier to find clients and to and to give a lot of value because uh, you don't have to you know you don't have to pay for expensive clearing houses and all these other processes that larger funds have to pay for. Okay, great. I, I saw a lot of uh, nodding and smiling there, Susan. I would love to hear your perspective on these topics too. Uh, I guess I don't have too much more to add. Sure. I was just like 
kind of learning about that because yeah the the company where I work at is not so much in this type of financial market but rather in a kind of a VC slash investment space so yeah it's it's a bit different so okay great now um, one of the things that you touched upon Justin um, was just um, challenges of infrastructure or putting things into production. And uh, you and I chatted about a little bit about this the other night too. I would love to hear uh, uh, just some more about the challenges of going from an invention or an idea to something that's actually working in production. Oh, wow. That's, I guess I, I, on the highest possible level, I can say that it took me about four months to write a lot of what I'm doing is is based on um, an idea I have about uh, multi-agent processing and about how in the future I think that finance will be distributed. So a lot of my thinking and a lot of my uh, philosophy is baked into the project. Um, but um, I guess I can say that the bulk of the simulation work for my master's thesis was probably the first uh, was probably the last four to six months of my master's. And, uh, you know, was publishable, it was good work, and, uh, you know, left a lot of loose ends. But I can say that uh, about three or four years of the project have been spent on actualizing a lot of these, the, you know, the real experiments. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the kinds of issues we face are, oh, when we're trying to execute an order, the decimal precision has to be exactly six decimal places, not seven. Um, not five. And if, if not, then the system will crash. And so a lot of the issues we face are extremely mundane. And I think that's the same for most machine learning applications. So when I was working with Fleet Ops, uh, we had created a regression algorithm using multi-agent learning, actually, that would help match truck drivers with freight. And most of the issues we faced when moving to production were based on the idea that the sensor would give us a, a reading of where it was on the earth that it wasn't. And so, you know, we could do all these really great tests, but at the end of the day, this, the sensor values coming from the truck were, were completely inaccurate. And the same is true of the market. You know, you'll get some price data from an instrument or some sentiment data from a model, and it just might not be true. And so your models have to be sufficiently robust. And um, some of the learning is that, and I mean, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pronounce this person's name wrong, but Marcos the Perez Lopez, I, you, Florian, you might know who I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. But this there, there's a researcher. I'll find his book so I can I can actually give you the proper reference. Talks a lot about how you have to test your model in production or in real time, and then take these sort of errors you get back, and then introduce those into your testing environment. And that the actual process of bringing a model into production is one of putting, you know, theoretically testing it in your testing environment, putting it into production, getting some experiences from it where you're surprised by some of the sensor values or the, 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 the state values, and then you back propagate those, well, not back propagate, but integrate those into your simulation engine. And so there's this sort of, sort of human process where you iteratively, um, as a human being, optimize your, your testing and, and production apparatus. And it's extremely time consuming and, and very, very mundane but also uh, very rewarding if you get it right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Susan, I know that you have some experience productionizing reinforcement learning as well. Do you, uh, can you speak to the challenges or, and the pleasures? <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess I mentioned a bit earlier on too. I think the, like, I personally feel that putting RL in production is one of the most rewarding parts, um, even though it does not come out anywhere as, pretty or as frequently as uh, let's say you're just running simulations, but I feel that is such an important part like of kind of building a career in reinforcement learning, like just the value of just like getting it out into the real world. Um, because I myself, just to put it into perspective, like I got into reinforcement learning from my interest in games. So actually on the side, I, I have uh, started a profitable game studio and this is just a hobby. Um, but that, led me into reinforcement learning, but it was kind of stuck in the kind of closed environment um, situations where you could just like, yeah, of course you can simulate like hundreds of thousands of games and great. And I think that that was really fun for me 
as a kind of mental exercise, right? Like, okay, this is great. This is fun. Um, we can get RL agents to beat the games. And, and then what, right? So then when I was able to work on that in production, it was more messy environments, uh, being able to represent those states. And like, I guess the, the two other speakers have mentioned, like that's a big challenge in terms of like, how are you representing what's good and bad? What's the agent learning? And uh, what are some decisions in terms of the timeframes that you're getting this feedback from? Um, do you have the infrastructure to be getting this feedback back in the first place, right? So I guess, I think Justin mentioned a bit about like putting into production and some like minor issues and like integrating stuff like that. And for me, I faced the same issue as well. Like that is such a kind of underrated part of industry reinforcement learning work that is not, it, it's just like, prettier and cleaner in an extremely closed like games environment um, but then having to learn how to deal with that uh, kind of how the company is ingesting different types of data there were days where <laughs> I mean, I've run into days where I think like the ingestion of the data just like you know broke and then well guess what that day the agent's not like learning anything unfortunately and I've dealt with that too and it's just uh, sometimes a bit of firefighting, but overall, um, part of the challenge is, yeah, like uh, kind of figuring out ways to iterate on what's being put out into the real world and getting real interactions, uh, improving that, dealing with infrastructure, which is often behind the scenes and less glamorous or sexy. <laughs> um, but that's just part of what I find really fun in terms of RL in production. So, yeah, those are those are my thoughts. That's great, thanks. Um, now getting back to the topic of reinforcement learning, I, we've, we've got a bunch of people in the room who are smart and experienced, uh, if not necessarily in RL, uh, but I wanted to uh, try and give them some starting points. And I was gonna ask you, Justin, um, if there were, if there's some core concepts to reinforcement learning that beginners should start with, what might those be? Um, I don't want to, if I, anyone has better, better suggestions, I'm totally open. Um, but I find for myself, it can feel a little bit like a paradigm shift. And I, I had a similar question in a breakout room. And I think that practicing shifting a problem into a state space and an action space problem is kind of the first step. Um, and you'll find that if you practice, cause I, I'm, I'm an RL guy, that's my jam. And so I can usually take traditional problems, even something like image recognition, and do some mental gymnastics and reframe that as a state space and an action space problem. And if you, it's very biological, right? Like we're human beings, we manage to solve everything by being in different, different state spaces and then taking different actions. So try to imagine your systems with that breakdown. And then you, you run into the problem of, oh, my state space is very big or my action space is very big. And then you apply creativity to the dimensionality reduction if you want to use a classic re reinforcement learning method. So I think that's a good starting space. And if you create a sufficiently small state and action space, you can um, try very elementary, quick methods to, to, to regress to a solution. Um, by playing around in that state space. And then, you know, and then so part of the fun is, as, as was mentioned by Susan is, um, oh, and also Jennifer, is by, uh, is coming up with suitable reward functions such that um, your agent rewards itself properly. Like sometimes I give myself a lot of rewards for eating lots of hamburgers and it's not the best reward function because it doesn't optimize my long-term um, health reward function. So I think like, but that's part of the fun of, of thinking in a sort of reinforcement learning uh, way, because uh, it's, it's very, it bleeds into this, this sort of fabric of, you know, your agent learns something, you're like, I think that's what I would have learned if I had the same reward function. So it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Florian if you had thoughts on this topic too, and also uh, maybe more tactically, if people wanted to start out with reinforcement learning, what are some projects that they might begin with? So to answer your first question, I think like dealing with these types of edge cases, and we had a similar question about like kind of emergent behavior in our room. And then it's like the idea is similar to what Justin said, like you look at how you come to this 
algorithm is data because what fundamentally all these reinforcement learning algorithm does it just optimizes like a state action space value function and then based on this value function it does it this uh, its decisions and then you go through these kind of functions and these kind of these energy spaces and think okay based on the rules and based on the game yeah this this decision makes sense and then it, then they can find things you would normally not not find as a as a if you just do it yourself so if people want um to start doing reinforcement learning what helps a lot is mm, just to go through each each individual algorithm right so there's the the Sutton book which goes a little bit through the fundamentals so i would do the first part this is like chapter one to five or seven, like the whole thing up to the um, everything that's like a Markov chain processes, Q learning, and uh, dynamic programming solutions. Because kind of the dynamic programming and the Markov chain, they kind of are the fundamentals for the Q learning. And once you've done all the Q learning in the chapter afterwards, it talks a little bit about double Q learning and all the other things. So I would recommend reading these these chapters. And then at the same time, implement those algorithms, right? Or look how they're implemented. And they're like uh, good repos or tutorials or websites. And I think there's also some documentation on, on the here and ACE where you can, where it goes through all these individual steps and these methods and shows you some examples. And normally I would suggest just to use some kind of toy, toy problem. So this uh, gives you the, so you don't have to deal with, so once you code a reinforcement learning algorithm, right? And you do at the same time a new environment or an environment you don't know, and then something doesn't work, you don't really know where where's the bug. So once you want to debug it, you don't really know where, where to go with. But if the say the it's a toy environment and your reinforcement learning algorithm doesn't work, you know that your bug must be somewhere in the way within the reinforcement learning algorithm. And after you're done with the thing from the starting book, there's an open RL called spinning up RL. So they're gonna go through more high level, like they also go through this basic stuff really quick, but they also they do more detailed about the high level algorithms and just look how they're implemented and at the same time read how they they work in, work in the paper. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, one thing I, I thought it might be worth mentioning now is that ACE is starting up a series of study groups on machine learning topics. So I just wanted to let you guys know that's happening and uh, reinforcement learning will definitely be on the list. It's just one more reason to sign up on our website, get involved with our hook, get hooked up with our Slack channel um, because we'll be posting information about that all the time. Uh, in the near in the near future, um, wanted to ask about what I guess this is a, a double double sided question um, about the limits of reinforcement learning and what it what it can't do, but then turning that around and saying what what is the future of reinforcement learning based on this the stuff that you guys have been doing uh, and working on be curious to know where you see things going next. And maybe Justin, I'll ask you to start. So I'm very biased because I have a research interest and I personally believe that um, more sophisticated hierarchical models will be, uh, will be, will be sought after. So we've seen um, that reinforcement learning suffers from the curse of dimensionality very quickly. And the way people have gotten around that, to my knowledge, so I, I have to preface this with, I haven't been deeply involved with the literature for about 24 months. Um, but um, the way people have got around that is by using deep methods to characterize the state and reward functions and the state action space. Um, and so that's kind of a bit of a shortcut and it works extremely well. But I think that like how neural networks are hierarchical, that reinforcement, reinforcement learning will have a richer toolbox of hierarchical methods uh, and that will they will enjoy a performance uh, in uh, in areas like image cla classification similar to uh, you know neural networks convolutional neural networks etc so i think that that's going to be on the horizon i don't think i think people are working on that sort of thing now um, and i'm kind of excited to see what comes out okay that's great um, florian i wanted to hear your point of view on the topic as well 
I feel like with research, like I work in research for, so I did a PhD and I did a postdoc. So I worked some significant amount of my life in research and research is fundamentally very difficult to predict. Say how GPT and say, just go to natural language processing, how much this field has changed in a very short time of month. So it's going to be very difficult to predict which methods going to be work, which going to be a breakout. Say even deep, deep Q learning was quite a big breakout in recent years, which already some significant amount of time has already passed. Uh, when this was a big thing. And it's going to be very difficult. I think we're going to run into models that can better generalize. So they can do, I feel like for the rich next step, people are going to make models that either much, much bigger, but can deal with or kind of pre-trained models that can deal with less data. Or in general, it's going to be models that can do really well with with without having to simulate data. So. There are some kind of model-based deep Q learning uh, algorithm that kind of try to learn the simulation and the reinforcement learning algorithm at the same time, but they don't tend to work that well right now. But you never know where they're, where they're going. But I think the next big breakthrough is similar to like say where GPT or vision is coming, that you get like some really big general learning model. This is what they all are, are fighting for or striving to. To have this kind of general learner, but it's really hard to say what's what's going to be the next big thing. I would say it's close to impossible. Sure, that that's fair. Um, Susan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, I guess once again, my my interests are definitely in uh, kind of applying RL to kind of more messy or kind of production environments. But kind of to touch on that, I, I some some other points that have been made earlier um, is. I think now that we have such, it's possible that we get such large amounts of data um, as well as have the computational power to do that, right? Like we can start representing things um, with just neural networks and just using that to kind of grab and represent like state action spaces, uh, which I would suppose that earlier on, like decades ago, it was not possible. And I know we've already had some breakthroughs, but just like bringing it back to the whole, whole like industry application sense, we do have the amount of data. We can get the amount of data, but it's just like a lot of, I guess, companies or use cases, they don't have the infrastructure to kind of like pipe that all together. Like theoretically, yes they might have the data to do that. Maybe they need to start gathering that data, but it's all like lies on that infrastructure. So I think that actually is a part that fascinates me as well, which is like kind of getting that whole glue and that whole pipeline together to make it possible. Because yeah, like I think theoretically a lot of things can be represented. It's just like getting the copious amounts of data in the right place and getting that back out into the environment and having that feedback come back at a, you know, it could be like some sort of, longer cadence like hourly it could be if you want to do like really high frequency stuff then you'd have you'd need infrastructure that kind of like grabs it back gets the feedback like in a very very quick manner right so i think actually the infrastructure is also one of my uh kind of recent passions in in terms of uh productionalizing machine learning be it reinforcement learning or or not Okay, thanks. I um, want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us tonight, especially uh, our guest uh, speakers. I hope that you guys have enjoyed having the opportunity to interact with them. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll just thank you all for coming. Remind you um, that this event has been sponsored by Aggregate Intellect, that you, if you haven't already, you should get a free login on our website, which is ai.science. Um, and you can also join our LinkedIn group and sign up for our um, YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained. Uh, these are all just various ways that you can find out more about what ACE is doing. And I really hope that you guys will keep coming and get involved because it's been a, a really great evening. Um, thank everyone for coming and hope to see you next time. Thank you.